good to be here. This morning we're beginning this uh, section where different gifts of the Spirit are listed. And I uh, probably won't shock you to find out that this material is almost always misused or misunderstood. But what we will do is look at authorial intent, context, and understand what the issues were in Corinth and what we can learn and apply these things today. Let's begin with prayer. Thank you, Lord, for showing mercy to us, allowing us to look into the things that you've revealed, to learn, to grow. May we be filled with love for one another and for you who has given us these relationships in the body of Christ. Thank you for what you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 8, entitled this, Spiritual Giftings to the Benefit of uh, to benefit all, articulations of wisdom and knowledge. We're going to talk just about those two because wisdom and knowledge are both major themes in 1 Corinthians. And there are also things that were misused in Corinth. And so Paul has a reason to correct the misuse. Let's go to verse 7, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. Reading from the Lexham English Bible. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for what is beneficial to all. Now each one, I may have mentioned this last week, each one is a single word in the Greek, kostos, is used 22 times in 1 Corinthians. And in this particular section, it's used in verses 7, 11, and 18. The point here is that God uses each member of the body of Christ. And what's being corrected is the elitism that was prominent in Corinth. That there were certain ones who claimed to have special status as compared to others. And that is being corrected by various means. So each one is thematic as well. Everyone whom God adds to the body is part of the body, is necessary, and is used by God. And we don't have uh, any license to create some sort of a hierarchy that would exclude people that God has saved. Now, let me also cite then here uh, verses 11 and 18 to show you that in this section, each one, akastos, is emphasized. 1 Corinthians 12, 11. But one in the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Now, they're speaking of the spirit who wills. Bulamai in the Greek there. And then for wills, 1 Corinthians 12, 18. But now God has placed members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. They're using uh, thalo, another word for will. So it's God's will to give the gifts to... Um, enable each one in the body to be used with whatever gift God's given or gifts. And this use is to the benefit of the entire body. So I think our proclivity to see the superstars and hot shots and super pastors and orders that would attract a lot of people to be who's important and to neglect what we might think would be ordinary Christians is wrong-headed. People have different gifts. People are part of the body of Christ who are born of God. And we need one another. 
And it's not wrong that some things are more obvious and prominent, some gifts, but we should never have an attitude of superiority, haughtiness, so that we would neglect various members of the body of Christ. That's what is being corrected. The word manifestation here, uh, in the form that it is, phoneros is kind of common, but here it's phonerosis. It's only used two times in the New Testament, and it means public manifestation. So it's not that only some are public and everybody else is silenced, but that every member has a function in the body of Christ, and it's not a silent one. It's not an unseen one. Now, there's ways that this works out, and we'll be talking about that, but we need to know the broad categories. So the uh, public use of the gift is something for each member. These gifts, as I say in my notes here, are not given to prove levels of spirituality or special status. We've talked about that a lot in 1 Corinthians. Referencing back sometimes to Luke, where they're trying to keep score, and Jesus rebukes them. They start arguing about who's the greatest, sometimes in the context of Jesus telling them not to do that. And this, we've got to be really careful, dear saints, because we love to keep score. We want to keep score on everything. But when it comes to the value of God's work through his body and each of the members, by his grace, by his spirit, it's not our uh, prerogative to keep score. And I've often cited 1 Corinthians 4 or 5. Do not go on passing judgment before the time. Wait until the Lord comes who knows the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's God's prerogative. It's our prerogative to love one another, love the Lord, be attached to the head, and to serve one another however we're able to, given the realities of how God's at work. Now, if you want to turn to this, it's an important verse, 2 Corinthians 4.2. I don't have it on a slide, but 2 Corinthians 4.2. Thinking about this word manifestation, which is also used there. Panerosis. 2 Corinthians 4.2. But we have renounced the hidden things hidden because of shame. Not walking in craftiness, or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Paul's talking about his apostolic ministry. And he's renounced things hidden because of shame. Hidden motives. Tricky ways to make yourself look great. To... Uh, Touch things up to make everyone else look worse and make yourself look better. Anything like that is renounced. Craftiness, making the Bible seem to say what it doesn't say. That sells a lot of books. And uh, identified one in uh, my dispute with the seeker movement where you take passages, remove them out of context, make it sound like they're there to enhance the status of the whoever's reading. And one example I gave was uh, this Purpose Driven book was saying Noah made God smile using craftiness by using a translation that had no concern about what the text actually says. The text says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Or he found favor in the eyes of the Lord. One, which is what the word of God says. In one case, what is being said is that God was gracious to Noah in the midst of a wicked situation. 
The other way of using craftiness to twist the word of God is saying we have something to give God that he needs, thus totally reversing the intent of Moses, the biblical author. So that's really what sort of thing that Paul is renouncing. Crafty. Well, we know about that because we're in a political season here in America. The craftiness is off the charts. Making things seem like they are different than they really are. It's not suitable for Christian ministry. Now, I wanted to cite Dr. Paul Gardner. Well, Paul has established that all Christians are spiritual on two grounds. One, all proclaim that Jesus is Lord and can only do so by the Holy Spirit. We've seen that. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit, meaning truly confess that. Secondly, says Gardner, all are given different gifts by the same Spirit, that is, by God. The Son, the Spirit, and God are all mentioned here in a Trinitarian way. So all are gifted. All who are can truly confessing Jesus as Lord are spiritual. We talked about that lately. And all are part of the body of Christ. The word beneficial can also be translated profitable. Perhaps it is in your translation. And uh, this word sumum pharaoh is used also in 6.12 of 1 Corinthians 1 and 10.23. It's the same, basically the same thing. I'll just cite 6.12. 1 Corinthians 6.12, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful but I will not be mastered by anything. So profitable means to the benefit of the body of Christ so that as we serve the Lord, as we serve one another, as we are being used by God, everyone also attached to the head, part of the body, is benefited. And that's how God comprised the body. That's the point here. Thus, we often speak of the organic church, meaning those who are converted are attached to the head, whoever they may be in the body of Christ. Now let's go to verse 8 and talk about, or 8a, and talk about wisdom. 1 Corinthians 12, 8a. For the one to, excuse me, for to one is given a word of wisdom through the Spirit. I'm going to talk about wisdom separately. Wisdom and knowledge are very important in 1 Corinthians. They were very important to the Corinthians, sometimes in bad ways or possibly in good ways. Given is in the Greek a passive, a divine passive, by God. Okay, so this logos word of wisdom that's using a genitive construction, which can either be objective or subjective. Uh, and I'll explain that in a bit by a citation. So uh, this word of wisdom is given by God, and it's for the benefit of all. Lagos uh, implies in this context an utterance because we're told this is a public manifestation. So someone's will utter wisdom from God to the benefit of the body of Christ or articulate wisdom. Now, we've got to define wisdom. Eric was doing a fantastic job this morning in Sunday school defining wisdom. The word in the Greek is Sophia, used 17 times in 1 Corinthians in either a negative or positive sense. What do I mean by that? Well, Paul distinguishes between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom that comes from God. Because wisdom was considered 
a great virtue and something to be sought by the Greek sophists. Sophia would be the word wisdom. It was very prominent in the Greek culture as they claimed some of the philosophers to be wise or to espouse wisdom. The Corinthian elitists likely came, claimed special wisdom since Paul warns against false wisdom. So there were elite wise ones who evidently brought with them when they came into the church whatever status they had in the Greek Roman Greek world of being wise and they wanted to be considered that in the church. But notice here, in one, I'm going to cite 1 Corinthians 1.19, that Paul, I'll also say verse 20, Paul cites Isaiah 29.14, 1 Corinthians 1.19 and 20. Paul says, quote, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. That was Isaiah 29, 14. Verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 1. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? We'll talk about this some more in our applications. The context and the whole tenor of this book of the Bible, 1 Corinthians, indicates that some within the church had brought in with them their status of being the wise in the world. And they evidently were getting off track in, regard, in regards to the true wisdom of God. Paul did not come with the wisdom the Corinthians cherished. He came to Corinth, spent 18 months there, and he spoke about the truth of Christ and the gospel. But some there didn't want to give up their status of being wise debaters in this world. He said in 1 Corinthians 2, 1, when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God. We all have seen silver-tongued orders who can speak eloquently about things that if we're rational about it, we know is that are absolutely false. And they can speak the falsehood so with such flowery language and such enthusiasm that you can be wowed by it and deceived because it's a bunch of lies. And so we can't go by how it feels or how it seems or how it tickles our ears. We have to objectively look at what is said and whether it's true wisdom or knowledge, depending on what the topic is. Paul did not come to tickle ears. He came to teach cold, sober truth about the things of God. I want to cite Thistleton on Sophia in the Greek sense. He has his own translation, but here's what he says. Our proposed translation relating to wisdom reflects two points. First, the genitive, Sophia's, may either be subjective genitive. Now, let me explain that by citing him. Articulate, articulate utterance. It's an utterance and it's articulate. You can understand what it is. That's that would be an objective genitive, or uh, and it would be about God's wisdom. Second, 
uh, excuse me. Second, Sophia was clearly a catchword or slogan in the uh, community, excuse me, the Corinthian community. So we have an articulate utterance or something derived from wisdom. So objective would be the objective content, subjective where it's derived from. I hope I got that right. Ask me afterward. The background which controls the exegesis therefore derives from the contrast between the pretentiousness and competitive status seeking of human wisdom. I have wisdom. Listen to me. I know what's right. And say this in such a fantastic way that you wish you had it. But it may be a bunch of destructive lies that are going to lead you where you don't want to go. That's what Paul's warning about. Do you know how Paul defines wisdom in 1 Corinthians? How, what is wisdom? The answer is Christ crucified. Christ crucified is the wisdom of God. Christ crucified is considered foolishness to the world. You mean God's wisdom is that I believe in this Jewish person who was crucified and rejected both by the Romans and by his Jewish brethren. That's what I have to believe to have wisdom. What do they think about that? Foolishness, nonsense. That's what they think. But it's cold, sober truth. What if the wisdom that God brings is wisdom that will save your soul and give you eternal life? Forgiveness of sins, redemption, atonement. And why would it be wise to send wisdom in a package like that? Crucified Jewish Messiah who was well pleased for God to do so because he wasn't appealing to the wisdom of fallen humans. Let's go to the idea of knowledge, gnosis, 1 Corinthians 12, 8b. And to another, a word of knowledge by the same spirit. So wisdom and knowledge are first in the list, probably because they're the most emphasized in 1 Corinthians. We've heard a lot about wisdom and knowledge throughout this passage, both good and right and what is wrong and in error or of a bad motive. So this logos that consists of or comes from, depending on objective or subjective, knowledge is a gift of the spirit. And Paul warned about that in 1 Corinthians 8. I have that in my application, so I won't go through it now. This articulation of knowledge in verse 12 is, excuse me, this articulation of knowledge in verse 12 is not the domain of elitists, but of the body. Let me quote verse 12 to give you a preview. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. For even as the body is one, yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. So we have differences, different members, but one body, and it's not the domain of certain high-valued elitists compared to ordinary Christians to have knowledge. If you don't know the Lord, you don't belong to the Lord. And all oh, the ads for these things, the emails that I get, it's just unbelievable. In fact, the, this word of knowledge, in my opinion, and, we, and I've written dozens and dozens of ar articles, it's amazing how many times this comes up, someone will propose some man-made process 
for solving some problem, and they'll claim that the way you get the thing to work is by a word of knowledge. And their word of knowledge has nothing to do with what Paul's talking about. Their word of knowledge is gaining your own revelation of secret things that belong only to God. And so I'll, I'll mention some of these. And this was one of their slogans, and it'll be in one of our applications. We all have knowledge. That's what they claim. We all have knowledge. We all know what was the result of their knowledge. We get to go to the pagan idol temple and dine. That was what their knowledge was. We got a revelation from God. It's okay to go dine with the pagans in their pagan worship service. That was in chapter 8. Let me cite again Gardner. It was probably a word from God that spoke to the immediate needs of the church, applying ideas or theology to a specific required action by, by the people. And let me stop there. That's exactly what I believe and have taught for some decades now. Rather than this being, oh, I got a revelation from God. And then it's telling us something that cannot be known by any ordinary means. Rather, the knowledge is the knowledge of what God has said to those who know him relationally and implications and applications. Because this is true biblically, therefore, in our situation, this would be action that would be wise and knowledgeable based on what we know to be true. In a sense, that's what Gardner's talking about. Required action. Based on what? On what we know to be true. Not on, I think God's telling me. And in some subjective word. Back to Gardner. We suggested earlier that it was perhaps by a word of knowledge, in that case a deficient one, that the elite were arguing for attendance at idol temples because an idol is nothing, 1 Corinthians 8, 4. Then he points out that Jewish literature is deeply practical. Eric's talking about that today in Sunday school. Deeply practical. I won't cite it anymore, but dear ones, the elitists always have a revelation, not judgeable or accessible ACC by ordinary means. They have it. They had the experience. They have the revelation. And we are the dolts who have to listen to them if we want to get in on it. That's continual. It's abusive. It's ubiquitous. And I want to warn all of us, don't listen. You will be harmed. Now, I have a list here. I've written articles on every one of these. But I have a list of things and teachings that I've heard in the last 40 years or 50 years, really, that have been used that require a word of knowledge to implement it, according to their definition. Number one, spiritual warfare teachings. What do I mean by that? Well, one of the things is the claim that there's certain domains, geographical domains ruled over by certain principalities and powers, and the way to forestall bad outcomes for each person is to get a word of knowledge about what spirit is over what domain and to bind the spirit and rebuke it so the good things will happen. That teaching is still out there. It's been going on for decades. And it requires getting a special revelation of secret knowledge to implement it. But you have no way to know or judge whether it's even valid. How do you know that uh, whatever, Hennepin County is under a certain spirit and we better bind it? They've been binding these demons for decades, and all the evil just getting worse. I want to know, why does it never work? It just flat out is false. 
Generational curses. I, I wrote an article about that. Well, if you go back four generations, you have whatever it comes out to, 64, all the different possible causes. So some ancestor did something, and we don't even know who all our ancestors are, and whatever they did is causing us harm now, and we have to renounce whatever it was they did and break the curse so that we can have well-being, but you don't know who it is. So how do you know who it is? Unless it's something objective, which it generally isn't, well, you get a word of knowledge. But now you have the subjective discerning the subjective, and you're just in a pile of goo and goop and confusion. Here's a simple way. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Cursed is the one who trusts in man. That's how you figure it out, and that's very simple. First memory event, that's theophosic ministry. Well, how do you know you didn't have an event that you can't really remember? Well, you get a word of knowledge. Recovered memories. Whole books written about recovering memories. In some cases, what's recovered never happened. And that abusive teaching went on and on until finally lawsuits stopped it. There were some claims made that included dates and places, and one pastor lost his job, was sued for millions of dollars, his life was destroyed, but he was able, through legal means, to prove this recovered memory could not have happened because there were enough details, and he won the lawsuit. So you can't use the subjective and call it a word of knowledge which takes, uh, sounds legitimate because you hear about a word of knowledge here in this verse, so therefore it must be a recovered memory. I one time walked into this place where I was going to give a teaching and there were other teachings going on and I heard some people talking to one another and they were kind of working through their past to wipe out whatever's causing the problem. Well, where are you at? Well, I'm at age two. Where are you at? I'm at age one. And they're going through getting their memories wiped out so they could have better ones. No. Contrived deterministic psychological teachings, inner healing teachings, finding this pristine injured child. Don't believe it. The word of knowledge is an articulate discourse, logos, word, based on what we know is true that is applied based on valid implications and applications that will benefit anyone. So we, had a, we have a number of those every Sunday morning in Sunday school. So therefore, there's no justification for trying to gain secret information. Let's go to the applications. <clears throat> this section on gifts shows the value of each one in the body of Christ. That's the bottom line. The value and importance of each member of the body. Number two, we must consult the larger context to understand true and false wisdom or knowledge and apply what was taught to this section on gifts. I'll submit to you that once you understand what's really said objectively, contextually, and practically, the abuse goes away. And the help and encouragement and unity of the body of Christ is enhanced. And grandiose claims seem absurd and our love for one another is enhanced because we see how badly we need one another. None of us has some uh, status where we solve everybody's problem and solve every issue, but we definitely are dependent on the Lord and one another. Let's look at some passages uh, that will come to soon, give you a little preview. 
1 Corinthians 12, 11, and then 12, 18. <clears throat> but what in the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills? And then verse 18, but now God has placed the members, each one of them in the body as he desired. God does it. It's God's work. God does the gifting and placing. You wouldn't believe the emails I get. I, I allow myself to be on some of these lists so I just know what's going on. You wouldn't believe it. Come and take my course on the school of the supernatural. The school of the supernatural. Take my course on obtaining supernatural knowledge. Take my course on visiting the third heaven, or whatever it is. So this whole realm that we ought to be dependent on the word of God to understand becomes a course on the subjective, what I think and what I feel about spiritual activities. It's not right. The reality is far more seemingly mundane. And the reality is far more powerful. The reality is far more helpful and beneficial, to use the word that Paul uses. God is using each of you, dear saints, to benefit one another in various ways, whether they're splashy or hidden in some ways, though very real. 1 Corinthians 12, 21. Let me cite that. 1 Corinthians 12, 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet. I have no need of you. That's a slogan, by the way. Using a kind of a metaphor. First Corinthians is full of slogans. I don't need you. What is that all about? Do you know how harmful that is? When people born of God, empowered by the Spirit, grafted in, attached to the head, alive because of the spiritual life given by God, are told, I don't need you. Go away. It's grievous. It's grievous when spiritual leaders silence the church. It's abusive when those who claim to be the leaders say, you're silenced without cause. The each one emphasis dominates this section for a reason. The spiritual elitists were silencing or dominating the spiritual have-nots. It's not right. It's not right. And it's heartbreaking, frankly. And a lot of bad things happen. Now, the background here continues to be the problem addressed in chapter 11 about divisions based on self-perceived status. And that at the Lord's Supper. Let's go to... One Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 1.21. Again, now we're doing a review. It's very clear. I hope the gravity of it weighs seriously upon us. Upon us. 1 Corinthians 1.21. For since the wisdom of, in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know 
God. God is well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Now here, now we're, we're talking about word of wisdom or word of knowledge. The word know sometimes is used in a relational sense. It can be used in a cognitive sense of no facts, things that are true, that's valid, and it can know it can be known in a relational sense. Relational knowledge has to know with having a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, having eternal life, having been attached to him, and know, knowing and loving him who loved, first loved us. So I had a statement. I kind of just said it. God uses, excuse me, Paul uses the term no to speak with a relationship with God. In this verse, coming to know God is the result of being saved by faith in Christ through the gospel. Relational knowledge of God does not mean knowing secrets that others lack. Knowledge, excuse me, people who know God did not get that way by knowing more wisdom and knowledge than others. They believed the gospel. How did you come to know God? Well, I'm really smart. Smart. I'm like a dictionary. Better yet, I use Google. Then I can really know things. But this knowing of God is through forgiveness of sins, regeneration. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to God, the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and our sons forever, that we may know, observe the words of this law. Secret things belong to God. So a word of knowledge isn't going to reveal secret things. They belong to God. That's simple. Let's go to wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1. 22 through 24. For indeed, Jews ask for signs, Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So the wisdom of God is foolishness to the world. The power of God is through Christ and what he's done for us. And this is not something that's simply uh, dictionary knowledge. It's something that God gives. The mes message of Christ <clears throat> crucified does seem foolish, but it's God's wisdom. The wisdom of God is greater than anything you'll ever know through the means of man. Uh, Eric's been talking about the Proverbs, Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Notice the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you don't fear God, you don't know and understand. Wisdom is to trust in God. The knowledge of the Holy One is relational. Let me share the gospel with you. Jesus Christ, God the Son, the creator of the universe, the one who came into our world, fully human and fully God in the incarnation, Born of, born of a virgin, revealed as the sinless one who did many powerful deeds to demonstrate who he is. He predicted his own uh, death on the cross, which happened. 
He was raised from the dead on the third day. His blood is uh, the means for the forgiveness of sins. He was raised from the dead and ascended to God at the right hand. By, and many witnesses saw this. Why is it important? Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. The, the, excuse me, the uh, objective reality of the gospel is that if you trust him and believe him, you're forgiven and you have a relationship with God and you have the gift of eternal life. Today, repent and believe the gospel. Turn from sin. Turn from darkness. Turn from serving self. Turn to Christ. Believe on him. Trust in him. And those who are trusting God through Christ are born again and given a new life. That's the gospel. I thank you, dear ones, for sharing the gospel, for pre preaching the gospel. And I do thank uh, our evangelists who go out of their own uh, difficult way to be there to share the gospel. God bless you. We all have our own way of sharing it. Trust in Christ. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 and 2. Now concerning food, sacrifice to idols, we know that, quote, we all have knowledge, unquote. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone thinks he knows anything, he has not yet known as it is necessary to know. Here's the idea of the relationship. A relationship with God is knowing God, trusting God, and being part of his family. Puffs up means full of pride. I know something you don't know. One of the things that are that's really uh, bad and harmful is this secret knowledge. I know what you don't know. So silly you, you better ask me. But this knowledge here is relational. And their slogan is, we all have knowledge. That's their slogan. The truth is that if you are trusting Christ, you do know God relationally. It says in 1 Corinthians 13, 2, and if I have the gift of prophecy and I know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as uh, I can remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. That's, we'll get into that, the love chapter. It's not enough to just have data to make yourself elite. Some claim freedom, this is my statement, some claim freedom to dine at the idol temple on knowledge that an idol is nothing. The idol is nothing, so I can just go there. It doesn't mean anything. Paul demurred and said, no, it's not right. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 8, 3 in this context. <clears throat> but if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Dear ones, when we go to be with the Lord, we will be known by him. And we will, our darkness will turn to light and everything that may seem a little confused will become totally clear and we'll know God. Having, here's my statement, having a relationship with God through faith in Christ leads to humility and gratitude, not a haughty attitude toward others in the body. You know, uh, I think we need to always remember that in the decades that I've done ministry, I love those who have served, for example, those in World War II. In the 80s, I would visit them 
spend time with them and learn from them. Those who have been around a long time and they can't do what they did earlier. I love these dear saints. And it's hard for people who get to the point where what they all, all did before, they can't do now. And they sometimes feel like, well, then what's the point? What good is it? What good is it? I don't have anything to contribute. And that's not what we want people to know or feel. We need to show love and concern and a relationship with those who have served no matter how long they may be, how old they may get. My mother is turning 95 soon, and she's really got a lot to offer. One last thing as we come to a close here is John 10, 14 and 15. John 10, 14 and 15. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus is the loving shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your love, and your mercy. Thank you for helping us. And thank you for putting us into the body of Christ so that we can support one another. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.